Hola a todos mi gente, si están, escucha este podcast, definitivamente son mi gente. Bienvenidos a otro episodio de Batch Pots y Chair Shots. Soy su anfitrión, jefe de oficio en marca por elección, soy Will Gray. Y estoy contento de estar en la Svesta Vieja y esta noche es la Vieja es Do the Ratings Really Matter? Resuerda aquí en la lugares fallidos y tierras de silla llamamos está en el ring de sede todos los rángulos. Joining me tonight is the professor of New Japan Pro Wrestling. She's a journalist extraordinary, host of the Squared Circle podcast, one of the queens of the IWC, Ms. Marie Shadows. Marie, how are you? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm 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 good. Thanks for having me, but 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 what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like half Spanish here, and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I've uh, always said I was bilingual, and I've never spoke Spanish on the air, so I was like, let's fuck with everybody tonight. Especially with having me on here. This is a great comeback for me to be on the show. Hola, Marie. <laughs> Hola, well. <laughs> also joining me tonight is the man who comes with his own disclaimer. That is the opinions of the Yellow Shoe Guy, or his and his and your own. They do not reflect the Botch Bots and Chair Shots or the Smack Draw Podcast Network. Bobby, how are you? I'm doing very well. It's my least favorite month of the year. No nut November. So we can't talk oh. about the nuts that are out there. Our truth, Gilberg and all the rest of them. Two yeah, minutes into the episode and Bobby said something completely inappropriate. Also yeah. rounding out the panel setting up on her iron throne in the boss bitch corner. She is the Beyonce to my hovis. She is the Bonnie to my collide. She is the boss bitch. Miss Allison Siegel. Allison, how are you? I'm good. I was really nervous for that, you guys. Like, you have no hey, idea. Hey, you did really good. Whew. Yeah. I'm good. We can. <laughs> the episode's done. We can go home now. I just wanted to get that on air. Uh, <laughs> so, I always start every episode the exact same way oh. every time. So, ladies and gentlemen, what has you pissed off for greatness tonight in the world of professional wrestling? What has you the most worked up in... It could be anything. Somebody's gear, somebody's match, somebody's story. Uh, Marie, I'm going to let you lead off because you're the guest. All right. So I was thinking about this like all day because it, it's like two things, but I, I guess they could probably be combined or whatever. Um, the first one would have to be that um, I don't like it when wrestlers attack fans and then want to say that they're playing a character if they're going after another wrestler in terms of like story and build. So, you know, the hot topic, I, I we're probably going to get into it maybe in news and rumors, but the hot topic over like the weekend was, you know, JD from New York getting like attacked from like everybody and stuff like that. And, you know, one that came out of nowhere in a sense, just over one tweet. Um, but then like on the flip side of Jade going over to uh, Instagram and Bow Wow trying to slide into those DMs, she's playing a character apparently. So I don't like it when wrestlers get upset at something. Uh, make a whole big spectacle and then want to be like oh i'm playing a character though when they're trying to do something else i'm just like you gotta like stick with the energy man like i just didn't like that i don't like that they use it as like a crutch or like a, a shield to be like well because i'm in wrestling i could do whatever i want to do uh for whatever they want and i really don't like that the second thing is that uh <laughs> AEW Dynamite was such a wreck of like random appearances that I was like, I don't like that. That's why I didn't really continue watching WCW um, when they had WCW versus WWE, like all the randomness. Like I need some type of logical story or something to connect with. Nothing like random, like Shibata showing up. I was like, why is Shibata here? Like what is happening? Like, you know, all respect to Shibata, but it's like, why is this here? So those are the two things that, that were like, what is happening in wrestling? Well, great thing about it is with AEW, if you didn't watch that second half of WCW and all that stuff, then a lot of the guys might be new to you, like that legendary new guy, Jeff Jarrett, who just made his <laughs> debut. So classy. I think this guy's going to have a career. I'm pretty sure of it. Yeah, man. Like, he's got to get the belt. You know, they're automatically going to give it to him. He's a brand new up-and-coming wrestler. Yeah, I, I, ho I would hope, like, him and Sting have a match because that would be just, just be amazing. It would. It would. Awesome. Be awesome. Miss Siegel? Um, my pissed off for greatness is I was reading something today about how, like, they've kind of sidelined KO 
because like Sammy's doing so well with like the bloodline stuff. I don't understand like why KO has to have Sammy. Like why can't he just be KO on his own? Like that's just irritating to me. Like he doesn't need Sammy and Sammy doesn't need him. But well, they apparently I- do. I, I will say this and jump in that like these two guys have been very inseparable since like the indie days and stuff. So like, you know, I'm guessing a fan wrote that. Um, and it's just one of those things of like, well, I can't they have to always like be together, but I totally understand. I only, I totally understand where Alice is coming from. Cause they don't really need each other like that. I... Yeah. Their bond is the strongest Cole Cabana and CM Punk. Yes. They're we were eventually probably going to get there. Their bond <laughs> yes, is as strong. Bobby's always stealing my freaking Headlines, cool, Barbie. It's cool. I also think that KO and Sammy <coughs> are the perfect match to dethrone the Usos come WrestleMania. Let that be Sammy's oh, turn man. on the bloodline to rejoin with KO. Then they take the belts off the Usos. Like, I think that would be super cool. But that's just me being a fan in that aspect. I think Sammy's becoming so popular that it's, it's a possibility he could take the belt off Roman. Yeah, I mean, they were talking about it today. If this was, uh, it was on, I think Bleacher Report reported it. They were saying, could this be something like a Kofi mania or a Yesel mania with Daniel Bryan, where the fans pretty much facilitate the push to get somebody in that position? Do you guys think Sami Zayn might be that person? I mean, why not? Um, It'll be like that story of like, uh, you don't see it coming type of thing. So, you know, I mean, we could all sit here and be like, oh, that's a great, that's a great thing. But in terms of character wise, will will Roman ever see that coming? I think Yeah, and I think the log- I think it's a logical end. Like it's you know, is is Sammy becoming too big just to take the tag belts with KO versus the Usos? Like, you know, this that whole Usi thing, hopefully WWE doesn't kill it like to the ground like they do a lot of other cool, like natural things. But yeah, like see, if you would ask me this Sammy like Sammy Zayn like six months ago or a year ago, there, I'd say there's no way, but Sammy's Sammy's got that natural uh, attraction now with the crowd, kind of like what Daniel Bryan said. Did. Mr. Mac, you're up. Oh, for pissed off or greatness? Um, yep. I, you know, I'm going to have to go with the ladies in the WWE that Triple H just naturally think that Emma was going to get a strong pop after five years of not being on the show. <clears throat> like, I really think they botched that whole thing. I think that they should have taken the time, vignetted her, and built her up and then re-debuted her. Like, I don't think against Ronda Rousey was going to have any huge effect in any city. And I think that pretty much, I think it already squashed her. Fair. She gave up her uh, OnlyFans to come back to WWE. Oh, really? That's the other thing I'm I'm upset about. (laughs) To Neil Dashwood's OnlyFans. That's what you're upset about. Yeah, she put a lot of good recipes on there. I'm sure that you that's the same reason you read that one article by Hefner, right? Was for the articles. Yeah, yeah. Paige Van Zant puts some really cool like stuff on there, like home living and things. I highly, highly recommend it. I'm gonna throw one in from the chat before I do mine. Is that Matt from Smackin' It Raw is still pissed that he doesn't have an adequate answer as to how time zones and daylight savings time affects spooky hours and ghosts. He's trying to figure it out here how do ghosts know it's three o'clock in the morning which time zone do they work on i still need answers i'm with you matt i still say we unionize the ghost so we know exactly what's going on oh my god okay i have one this week guys something has pissed me off enough that i'm bringing it to air okay and that's the okay. tribalism inside the iwc all right it's gotten bad ever since cm punk left AEW and you know, Bray Wyatt came back. It's been this ultimate pissing contest between the two companies and between the two fan bases. And what I'm here to say is, is time for the world to burn. And I think the only way to make that adequately happen is for CM Punk to show up in Stanford, Triple H to hand him a microphone, allow him to say whatever he wants in the most CM Punk way. And ultimately the gist of what he needs to say is me, Papa H and Steph are going to do everything we can to bury AEW. And I think that will start 
all the fires it needs to start between the two things, and I'm ready to see the world burn. I personally don't want CM Punk anywhere near professional wrestling, but at this point, fuck it. Let him go back to Connecticut. Let him do his thing. Let him do his piece. Let him say whatever he wants to, and let the fireworks start. That's what I'm excited for. That's what has me pissed off, is everybody's so enamored with where he's going to go or what he's going to do. Let him go back to Connecticut and start the biggest fire we've ever seen in the professional wrestling world. I mean, that could happen. I'll I'll always have New Japan, so I'll be okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just let it happen. Yeah, I'll I'll be okay. (laughs) Um, So we tried this segment last week. We're going to try it again this week. And it's the Botch Bots and Chair Shots Hater of the Week. Does anybody have one prepared? I mean, I I always have one. I didn't get any hate this week, surprisingly. And I posted TikToks. Normally, I get some hate on there. Bobby, do you have any? (laughs) No, I've only had fans this week. Um, Yeah, I've I've been I've been pretty good. We've we've only been on the air for a little. Are you someone's hater of the week? Uh, Yeah, I'm. Well, yeah, I did get in the one page like late Mm -hmm. Tuesday night, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the like they wouldn't even like let me into the video. Or no, no, they got mad because I wouldn't get into the video. So, like, oh. like, just for them to like kick, like, just for them to hear my opinion and kick me out. So I didn't. I was like, listen, I was like, you guys can pay me, and I'll get into your video. I was like, I'll charge you a hundred dollars an hour. That's the most Bobby Mac thing you could do in that situation. <laughs> oh, that that really pissed them off. <laughs> Man, I wish I could charge for that and get people and get people pissed off. But um, you know, I'm always gonna have my 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 one stalker on uh, Twitter. And uh, my stalker had asked, you know, if I can unban the stalker. And I was like, nope, because I don't want you coming into my DMs anymore uh, uh, to talk to me about wrestling or try to prove me wrong. And I will have a podcast dropping soon about that whole entire shit again. I can't. No, I think I did say, can you please unblock me? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Like you, you will have to do something really, um, stupid annoying like you know really don't understand where i'm coming from when i'm w- w- with my wrestling opinions and always want to try to prove me wrong uh for me to block you like it takes a lot <laughs> i'll keep trying all right uh, <laughs> i had to block some some dudes at the indie shows that we go to oh they were sliding all up in handful. those dms weren't they yeah it was really <laughs> uncomfortable all right Mine this week, I've got a fancy little graphic. You guys can't see it, but the guys watching will. The comment was, what a troll, clickbaiting, basement booking, WWE Mark wrote this, go fuck yourself. Um, So that's cool. I appreciate that comment. Um, Oh my God. I I apparently didn't have some nice things to say about AEW that day, but uh, there you have it. Those are the haters of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Now... I get to send it up to Allison, and I have to stop talking substantially. So it's time for news and rumors. Yay! Okay, so first one is probably the the biggest thing being talked about right now. Uh, Crown Jewel is still a go, despite imminent threats. Uh, I think this is really fucking stupid uh, that they didn't move the show like they're really risking these guys lives right now like even just the slightest bit of threat like i don't care how much money you're paying me nope hey you can't let the terrorist win and you can't give up those souvenir uh dollars at the stand Mm. (laughs) i think that with it being a bot show i think if they said okay let's just relocate give them an extra show next year when everything cools down and then sell 500 tickets at the pc there was a a fake graphic floating around that said that's what was happening but it was never made official or confirmed by wwe so i think if they did something like that that would probably be the better move i just hope for everybody involved the saudi citizens the wwe talent and executives everybody involved that they get through saturday unscathed with the level of threats that are being made yeah i just want like everyone to be safe um you know it's wwe's call at the end of the day and definitely saudi's call too like you know if they have the proper um i guess measurements in place even though anything can happen um they should be okay just for like saturday um but you know 
we're not over there. Like, we don't know what's really going on, what any kind of tensions are there. We're only just worried because, like, you know, it's, it's our people. And then, like, you know, they're far away from home. So it can't be like something happens, bam, you know, go go send the army right away. It'll take, it, it'll take some time. But I really don't want it to, like, get to that point at all. So everyone over there, make sure that you look over your shoulder and shit and, like, have your guard up. How crazy is it that as Americans, like, we're we're expecting the Saudi Arabians to actually protect our guys not I think not- so. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, the prince is paying a good amount of money. Yeah, he's probably going to protect them in, in, in the same way. I don't, I don't see the the government like being as bad as the media likes to make them to be. You know. Right. Yeah. I think. I think they've only really had that one hiccup on that first show with the plane and everything. So yeah. Since then, since then, it seems like it's you know been a lot better. You know, even even having as many women's matches as they're having now, mm-hmm. I'm on the shows. So when this thing first started. You know, there's no way that would happen. But now, you know, it's it does say something. But I think one thing, though, it really says something about Sami Zayn and his beliefs that he's still not going. Yeah. For sure. Um, so my next thing is uh, last night on Dynabite, we kind of touched Murray kind of touched on it. Uh, we saw some new faces, some old faces and some really old faces. Uh, Colt Cabana showed up. Like, who cares? What? He's uh, never been other than in podcasting. <laughs> Colt Cabana showed up. Uh, Rick Ross was there. That was and uh, Jeff Jarrett. Uh, the funny thing is about Jeff Jarrett is like he did that spot on SummerSlam in July. He was yeah, also you're... on Impact, and he also worked for NWA, which means and he's GCW. worked. Yes. GCW. So he's worked for pretty much every major promotion with the exception of MLW. Like the guy can't hold a job. He's all over the place. He can't hold a job, man. I mean, he's kind of like Punk. Clever. (laughs) I know. I know. Um, I think Rick Ross was the coolest addition to the show. I agree. Matt just chimed into the chat and I'm going to ride his coattails and say, yeah, Rick Ross was definitely the best addition to Dynamite last night. Who do you think botched the spot? Uh, no pun intended, between Jarrett and Darby with the guitar. Um, I think Darby probably forgot that it was going to happen. So he sort of like instinctively leaned in. So I don't know, man. Like I, I even when I saw it, I was like, yeah, it looks kind of weird. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that was weird for like Darby had an off night because that that thing where he got thrown into the steps too, like that seemed like it was way off. Um, I mean, having those appearances uh, were cool. I mean, uh, I wasn't expecting Jared to, to show up. And then Jared gets the All Elite graphic because he is the director of business development where he's helping to get more um, like shows, uh, I guess, in other states and like house shows and stuff like that. So he's he's in that department. And I'm like, cool. But does he have to wrestle? Even though like I don't, I don't mind Jared, but like does he have to do that unless like – I don't know. Is he going to coach any of these guys? Like, I don't know what's happening. I could only imagine he'd have some sort of backstage role. If he's there, you wouldn't you you would not have a wrestling mind like Jeff Jarrett coaching and producing matches and stuff. I would I can only imagine he'd be involved. I feel like appearances like these are just a kind of foreshadow for the conversation coming later. I think a lot of these sometimes are attempted needle movers by having the the pops because we know about the special announcements and the things coming and then one thing will happen and it'll be like, oh, and then something else will happen and it'll be like, oh, that's even cooler. You know, yeah, and then yeah. they keep stacking it like that. Uh, but I think Jeff Jarrett as a member of the backstage side of things for the first time, they could have somebody in an EVP role that not named Chris Jericho that has good, you know, experience in the wrestling business as a booker, as a promoter. You know, so I think, Jeff, yeah, I think Jeff Jarrett is a solid ad for AEW if Tony Khan lets him do his thing right. That's I think true. He could be, yeah, I think he could be a solid ad for the talent that want to learn. But the EVPs that are currently there are being invited back. You know, the Bucks and Omega, um, Page, even though he's not an EVP. You know, Page, is, Page has been put on record to say, you know, that he doesn't want to learn, that he already knows. Uh, Omega thinks he already knows everything. The Bucks, obviously, are the same way, so... It's, you know, really the guys that are going to want to listen, like the Darby Allens um, of the world that want to learn. 
uh, you know, MJF uh, of the world. So I think the buy-in is going to have to be, if he is going to be an EVP or if he's going to be on the same level as the Bucks and Omega, then there has to be a, there has to be a restructure of senior EVPs and EVPs. And somebody has got to be, take the lead and be the boss of the EVPs. Yeah. Because if not, everything is going to, you know, continue to be the same thing and be in this never ending circle. And then we all sit here and we're like, guys, you need some type of structure, some type of, you know, leadership. That's the only way that like um, a company continues to become grand and like, you know, get like cool shit, like in five years, six years, you know, they're still around and stuff like that. You know, I still hold out that I'm at like 1% right now of AEW surviving. Uh, just because I'm just like, guys, you got to get your shit together. Um, you know, uh, it was interesting to see Cole Cabana on Dynamite. I wasn't expecting that at all. And I felt kind of bad because I was like, damn, like he's been on Twitch the whole entire time. Hasn't said anything, made his money on Twitch and stuff. And then here comes Cabana and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. All right, cool. Let's see what this is going to do. Um, <laughs> obviously, the Internet was like, oh, this is Tony Khan being petty. You guys don't know that. Shut up. Like you guys really don't know. Um, aside from that, um, I'm a little concerned about Shibata because according to the Wrestling Observer, even though I don't really like putting them over or putting them on any type of platform, um, uh, mentioned how Shibata wanted like two matches with AEW, uh, superstars. So like he wanted to work with Orange Cassidy and want to work with Daniel Bryan. Orange Cassidy, I could be like, cool, you know, I, I don't mind that, but I am concerned about him wrestling, uh, Danielson only because of like Shibata's like almost deaf like deaf injury that he like he dealt with that luckily he he survived and he's able to still wrestle with us like i don't want him wrestling danielson just because i know how danielson could take it from zero to 100 at times and i'm like bro like i know you guys are technical wrestlers but like i'm just concerned about shibata wrestling <laughs> i'm here like why like i'm still like why is he here in AEW. I liked his return at Wrestle Kingdom, and to be honest, that was one of the first time I had ever had a chance to watch him work, and I was super impressed with... He had a technical match, and a lot of yeah. people were like, it was a wrestling school match. And I was like... It really was. But, but if you look at it and you watch the way they worked, it was like the perfect wrestling school match. You know what I mean? Like the timing was on point. Everything was crisp. You could tell who the heel was. You could tell mm -hmm. who the face was. Everything about it looked like two really, really great young lions coming out of the dojo, even though they were both established stars because they did the safest match possible. And it was still an absolute banger. So I was like, yeah. okay. So I, I was he, about it. Yeah, he fought um, Zack Zaber Jr. And they put on one hell of a technical uh classic um you know that's how much uh faith like shibata had in him in order to make sure that this match shined but everybody was still concerned about like you know he's coming back from from from, from an injury that he almost died from so miss siegel um let's see so some more aw things uh speaking of the uncle dave's publication um, so they're saying that a source close to Punk has said he's never going to wrestle again once his AEW contract is up. Uh, Ringside News says it's a completely different story. Every single story since the since the backstage brawl has been different. There still mm -hmm. has been no video evidence, even though all the journalists were there, no photo evidence, nothing. And the internet has taken it as gospel, as if like it is true. And I am like, guys, whatever happened to like the first rule of trying to figure something out? Like you need some type of evidence to be like, this happened, this didn't happen, for it to be like true or not, right? So mm -hmm. like whatever it is now, it's whatever like they're just making up stories at this point for your hard-earned money that other people can use like original content creators like ourselves like i'm not gonna be uh hiding behind like trying to watch my words or whatever it's getting annoying like all these yeah. stories are getting annoying no one is holding them accountable but everyone wants to hold someone else accountable for like the smallest of things that they do on the internet yeah, yeah. and what does never really mean in pro wrestling like Shawn michaels came back like 10 years later um Terry Funk, how many times has he retired from pro wrestling? Yep. Like, there, yeah, there, there is no never in pro wrestling. So, um, Ric Flair, I don't know if you guys know this, just wrestled a match. Like, uh, like it's crazy. So, there's never, there's never a never in wrestling. And, you know, these guys are all taking guesses at it. Punk is a private guy. If he's talking to anybody, 
um, it's probably going to be people that he trusts, and they're not going to they're not going to spill the beans because Punk would like to look like the Cabana. He might know you for twenty years. He has no problem dumping you once you once he feels betrayed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Raquel teamed with AJ and Rey Mysterio during house shows this past week against the Judgment Day. Um, possibility of a faction called the OC. Well, they're already the OC. But I mean, like, but not, but they haven't on TV added Raquel. Oh, okay. So you're just saying maybe add Raquel as the female no, counterpart. They have been adding Raquel at house shows. So are you asking? To have somebody to fight Rhea. Okay. That's what, so are they adding her to, to be the counterpart against Rhea? I maybe. guess that's the suspicion since they're doing it at house shows. I think it's testing the waters. I think it's a cool idea, but you know, one of the ideas I saw somewhere on the internet today was the idea of having Charlotte be part of it since Charlotte and AJ have a pass from the uh, Mix Max uh, Challenge series. I do remember but that. But Charlotte's a heel. Uh, we don't this know week. That when she comes back, she might not be, though. I can't imagine her not being a heel, though. She's had successful babyface runs. I think yeah. now it's like she's too deep into it. Like, I'm not sure if I were to buy it. Yeah. I think she would have to come back and be pretty, like, she would have to come back super over as a baby face and just ride the wave of being back. But I think it's doable for Charlotte to be a face. Maybe. Maybe. Um, um, before before we move on from, from that, I don't know if I want uh, Raquel to uh, like be on the team with the OC and that's nothing yeah. against her. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. My brain automatically went back to like live joining just so that way she could be that like wild card factor because um in bullet club as a whole there's always been a wild card person um yeah. to like not i guess offset the balance but i'd rather have live uh join them in order to take out and Rhea. she has a history with Rhea too yeah so i'd rather have that they have a history going back to nxt as well mm -hmm. uh, yeah so i think that would be a cool addition i think she's one of the few women that could really test Rhea if they let them both work the way they need to you know, if they let them both get in the ring and really show out, I think they could be two women that could put it up. Um, so I, I think it would be a good addition. I'm curious to see how it goes, if that is the direction they go with the intergender stuff. Uh, when was the last time we had uh, an intergender match in WWE? Does anybody remember right offhand? Was it Extreme Rules in 2019 with the Lacey Evans, Baron Corbin, Seth Rollins, Becky Lynch stuff? Was that Probably. the last time we had one happen? <laughs> Probably unless we Google it. <laughs> I don't remember right offhand. I think that was the last one was because that was the extreme rules winner take all. If Seth and Becky win, they can't. Uh, Corbin and Lacey can't challenge for the titles again. Stuff. Um, so Katie says it's been too long, but I'm pretty sure that is. I'll, I'll look it up and correct myself on Twitter if I'm wrong. Let's just say it was. But I think we're overdue for some good intergender wrestling. Everybody else is doing. Triple A has tag titles for it now. Like. It's time to, to see some more work of it. Is it is it too new school or too old school that if they do an in their gender where the two genders meet? Like it's not just an automatic tag out. Like there is some is there is some physicality since they're doing it in amateur oh. sport right now. Like girls are wrestling boys, boys are wrestling girls. Like oh, it's, that's what you it's mean. Hap it's happening. Like it's really happening in real life. So is it time that we bring it back to pro wrestling where it's controlled? I think so. I don't yeah, see I mean, why not. yeah. If the two wrestlers are comfortable, like if um, you know, obviously, if the female doesn't mind like fighting the guy before tagging out to her, you know, uh, male tag partner. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, like well, in most cases, the female gets the gets the upper hand on the guy. You know, does a punch, does a cheap shot, whatever. <clears throat> but it's very rare that the the man's able to do retaliate. Yeah. So yeah, why not? I don't mind it. All right, WWE, WWE, you heard it here. You do have permission to have intergender matches where the men and the women go fist to cuff. Book yeah. it, Trips. Book it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Logan Paul made a statement that if he beats Roman this weekend at Crown Jewel, that he wants to go against The Rock at WrestleMania 39 for the belt. Logan Imagine Paul championship sit down. match against The Rock. 
Like, Imagine that. You, you want to go against the biggest draw in the <laughs> biggest show of the year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll take that. I'm surprised you didn't take Gilbert. <laughs> I want I, Gilbert, just, Gilbert on a house show. I'm just going to say this. Logan Paul, sit down, man. Sit down. He's not winning. Like, there's just no way. <laughs> I think anybody... I've said it before. I'll say it again. Logan Paul is just a bot face in a bot show. The Prince of Saudi Arabia looked at WWE like an a la carte menu and said, I want some Logan Paul and I want some Brock Lesnar and I want some Mm -hmm. Bobby Lashley and I want some, you know, last woman standing and some no DQ. And he just kind of plucked it and made his own little buffet for the show that he wanted. We know that uh, Roman is going to carry the belts till at least WrestleMania. So we're going to look at him because they're going to push him for a thousand days. If he carries it to WrestleMania, he'll be at a thousand days. He'll cross four figures. So I feel like there's no way he's dropping it before then. So if anybody actually thinks uh, Logan Paul is going to take the belt off of him, I'm not sure they actually watch professional wrestling. (laughs) Or Logan and Roman are telling that good of a story that they're believing it. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, do, I don't think they're that good of a story. I so do think I he hits real hard. So if he did actually punch Roman in the face, he hits hard enough to knock Roman out. I don't yeah. think that <laughs> Roman that, would allow that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think that could be the spot. It could be that punch, referee, bump, or him yeah. and the Let me ask you guys. <laughs> let me ask you guys a real question, okay? What if the whole build, and we know Logan Paul's a a little bit of a shysty dude. He's done some questionable things. He's done some stuff for some clicks. He's done some stuff for some views. What if he just did all of this just to get the shot to be in the ring with Roman, and he goes full shoot and actually tries to knock Roman out to claim victory? Like, Because if he knocks Roman out and Roman can't fight back, like they can't, you know... Be like, oh, wait a second. You're not supposed to win this match. This doesn't count. Do you think there's any chance at law, at all Logan Paul goes rogue and decides he's going to try to knock Roman Reigns out to actually try to take these belts off of him? No, because I guarantee you WWE covered their ass in that contract with him about shit like that. They would sue the ever-living piss out of him. Do you think Logan Paul cares with the amount of money he's worth? Um, I think they would destroy him. I would say Paul Heyman would be smart enough to cover it up in the ring anyway, and he wouldn't walk out of there with the belt. It's not. It's not like Flair going down to Puerto Rico in the you know early '80s. Like, mm-hmm. there's no way. Like Paul Heyman is way too smart. Like you know, you've got referees that are smart. Like you know, look at uh, like when uh, Pewter put a uh, angle in that uh, lock and was you know angle could have legitimately broken his arm. But the referee was smart enough to see the the small gap that oh I can count his shoulders down to three and it'll be over. Like these guys are trained professionals out there. You got Heyman who's a genius. You got the referees who's you know depending on which one it is. But like if it's a Charles Robinson, he's probably seen it all in his career. Um, you know you've got announcers at the table. You know if there's a Lawler out there or even a Michael Cole could be smart enough to direct traffic. Like it just wouldn't happen. Yeah, and I, I would add too that um if he did do that, that is career suicide because Roman is like their big money maker. Like Roman is basically the one that calls the shots. Like, you know, I see him as that. He's put into that position. And then if you wanna go rogue for the sake of going rogue, um, you know, you better either have like a damn good story to follow that up um the next night when you back here in the States. Or, you know, you don't come back into wrestling and you don't do anything else. Like, I would think it's career suicide. But no, that's not going to happen. Do you, I, mean, I don't think it's... Get, oh, go ahead, Bobby. Sorry. Go, so go ahead. Well, how, how, do you, how do you get on a plane in Saudi Arabia? Is it as easy as we would get on a plane in Saudi Arabia? Because no. you know he's not going to fly back on the WWE jet if that happened. So how does, how does he get... <laughs> My, he's going to have to fly, like, coach. Yeah. I <laughs> think he's got to... sure he couldn't do that. I think he's got enough. I think he could chase enough clout and he's got enough money to pay the lawsuits. I think if he really wanted to pull the clicks, he could, he would try to pull it off. I do have to agree with Ravage and the fact that he says the Usos would come in. And I absolutely think that the moment Logan went off script and tried to shoot on Roman, the Usos would jump in and absolutely destroy Logan Paul because he can fight one person one-on-one, but he's not going to be 
two big ass Samoan dudes coming over the top rope on him. Let's just call it what it is. Something tells me those two dudes aren't going to fight fair once the gloves come off. Of course not. I mean, Roman's also like much bigger than him. So, like, even though, like, you can say Logan Paul is a trained UFC fighter i'm pretty sure real world roman could probably beat the ever living shit out of him i think i could beat the ever loving shit out of logan paul i'll say it you get me back in ring shape i'll box him yeah wasn't uh, logan like he hasn't won a boxing match though right <laughs> he like owen whatever no he beat floyd mayweather well he beat floyd mayweather i don't even want to get into the situation i'm fully convinced now at this point that the all the paul fights are staged because mm-hmm. there were multiple points when Anderson Silva had Jake Paul backed into the corner when a trained fighter would have went in for the attack. He backed out of the corner instead of attacking. There's no boxing coach on the planet that is going to train a champion boxer to retreat when your opponent is backed into a corner. There was some fishy shit going on. Put him in a ring in Vegas with three un- like unbiased like boxing officials and let's see if he would have won that match. Like, is there such a biased boxing official? Well, he's he's <laughs> promoting dirty. he's promoting his fights under his banner now. You know what I mean? He's bringing in his own judges. He's bringing in all of it. Like all of it is under his umbrella. Yeah, but that's the same thing Don King did. Yeah, we saw how fucking crooked Don King was, Bobby. That's my point. The, the whole honestly, that sport is as crooked as any other sport that's even out there. Like it. That thing's been fixed for like 30 years now, like legitimately. Like there's, there's been, it's been very hard to watch boxing. I, I used to be a boxing fan. You want to talk about a sport that's going down quicker than AEW? That's professional boxing. <laughs> Fair. Miss <laughs> Siegel, what's next right. on your list? <laughs> um, the future of Sasha Banks is uncertain. Um, apparently, she has not even. She has not even been on the radar in creative conversations. They don't need her. Yeah, I don't think WWE needs her at all. Let her go live her life that she never got the chance to do because wrestling is always like, you know, always on the go. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. You got to do that. So now she's, um, you know, just being around stuff. Maybe she never got the chance to really do before, like, you know, life passes you by because um, she, you know, wrestling ages you faster than anything else. So, yeah, you now, know. Yeah, yeah. Now she gets to hang out and, with Mandalorians and Wookiees and be in a galaxy far, far away. She got that Disney <laughs> money. She don't need WWE anymore. You want to talk about... I say the same thing about Bray Wyatt and them. They're going to go wherever the biggest dollar sign is. And right now, the biggest dollar sign is a fucking mouse in Orlando. Yeah, that's sponsoring the New Year's Eve uh, ball this year. They're going to oh. dr- they're going to drop the Mickey ears down at in, in, uh, Times Square. Really? My, my goal this year yeah. is to be something where completely fucking awesome for New Year's. I haven't got to celebrate New Year's at all in years. So I'm going to do something badass this New Year's. I'm not sure what yet. <laughs> um, Let's see. Bodie released from WWE along with other NXT stars, but Bodie was released supposedly for being a handful backstage. Are you no. allowed to be a handful if you're on NXT? Have you even been around long enough to be a handful? No, which is why I got released. <laughs> um, I will say that the only person on that list that like I knew, well, probably no, and watched her and like she's a damn good women's wrestler is uh, Salone Jacobs. She was a notorious Mimi. Like I got the chance to watch her live and grow and like she's really really good so she's the only one that like i know <laughs> to be like yeah you know she'll, she'll she'll make it back on her feet you know for sure um the last thing i have wwe has completed their investigation on events um didn't really say much about it um, but a high-ranking member of wwe management 
has said that the backstage morale is the best, is the highest that it has been in the company in over a decade since he's been gone. And by the way, that 19 point, like $2 million is pocket change for Vince. So, you know, I'm, I'm poor, you know, that that's definitely not like pocket change. I'll be like Scrooge McDuck swimming in the money. So yeah, it's pocket change and it it's Vince in a investigation. Yeah. And I think as a company, they're going to have to say the investigation's over and they're going to hope that, you know, any of the stockholders don't want to pursue anything uh, because yeah. they, they could get in a lot of trouble if they did choose to, uh, to pursue that. This, yeah. The, uh... It's like, and the rest of his life in jail. The ridiculous statistic I heard was if you took into account Vince's complete net worth, the $19.2 million would be like somebody who had $10,000 in their bank account and somebody took 75 bucks from them. Like that's kind of the same. Like if you want to look at percentages, that's kind of what that's like for him because the amount of money that man is worth. So the $19 million he lost to be able to walk away, retire, take a pension and never have to do anything except for wake up and not die for the rest of his life. I still think he's a crooked, dirty old man who did some really jacked up things, but he got away with it. So until somebody can hang him out to dry, he's going to go right away and be old. Mm Going to be on the beach, man. He's definitely going to be on the beach. He said he had never, he hadn't taken a vacation in like 46 years is what he said. Yeah, man. So that's nuts. I mean, Pratt, go take a vacation, bro. But damn, you didn't have to, you know, be dirty and old. I'm just hoping that somebody gets an interview with him before he does, you know, end up having that last day. I still haven't heard back from WWE about it. Well, it doesn't yeah. work. <laughs> he's a he's been a contractor now. Oh, you're gonna true. have to probably you're gonna have to probably ask like McAfee to be like, "Yo, can you set that up for me?" Yeah, because I'll just call Pat McAfee up real quick. Marie. Yeah, he's your best. <laughs> he's your best friend, right? You probably have a better <laughs> chance of him than Vince. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Is that the last one on your list? Yeah, I said that before I said it. Okay, I was just double checking. I didn't want to be rude. So, it's my favorite thing. It's the meat and potatoes of the conversation. Uh, tonight, the question for you guys is, the ratings war between AEW and WWE, and do ratings really matter? Uh, so, I'm going to throw a number out there, and they're completely irrelevant to each other because of the two different time periods that they happened. Raw in 1998 had a nearly 8 million person viewership, which is their highest of all time. And AEW debuted in 2019 with a 1.4 million viewership. So like I said, apples to oranges because of different ages. So initially thinking about ratings, do you think ratings really matter? They they don't matter to the fan. I will, will say that. But for business purposes, they do. Like for advertising and promotions and things like that, they really matter. Um, but to the fan and the viewer, absolutely not. I don't know how to answer this right. I mean, I mean, there is no right or wrong answer. Oh, absolutely. Um, I yeah. do. Yeah. I do have to agree with Allison that like, you know, to the, to the viewer, the ones that are at home, just watching the product doesn't really matter to them. Um, their view actually like counts. Um, well, now that we know that the the freaking Nielsen company doesn't really count it as well as it should, but it still counts because they have it on their TV and stuff. Um, and it is for advertisers. Um, I do want to say that it sort of kind of helps the promotion, the CEO, because they know like who to target, what to target, get the right advertisers for it, and then also get the right fans for it because obviously the fans are going to like they're going to the shows, they're paying for the tickets. Plus, the ones that are at home that can't make the show are buying the merchandise so they know who to push and what to do. So it like it kind of does and like it doesn't at the same time. But fans think that like it really does matter, you know? Yeah, I think for the Internet trolls, it matters um, and the advertisers. And those are going to be the two biggest ones. Um, You know, you're going to hear, you know, like uh, Dave talking about, you know, the demographics and all this other kind of stuff. It I don't even understand how it even happens anymore since, you know, DVRs are such a thing. Like you don't have to watch anything anymore unless it's you know a, a true sporting event and you you want to see who's going to win you know that like that super bowl yeah that one you might want to watch live you know even if you're not a football fan but you know for pro wrestling you know again the advertisers are one thing but i think the other thing is just really the trolls that are out there they're the ones that watch it and want to brag about it 
and they probably don't even understand how it's done. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so you guys brought one of the things up and you mentioned the key demo. What that means yeah. is, is the age group from 18 to 36. I'm pretty sure with the exception of Mr. Mac there, he's the only person that just, just squeaks out of it. You're just barely out of that key demo there, Bobby. Um, yeah. 17. I'm going to be 18 though this year and I can't wait to be able to go in my uh, first, uh, nudie bar. Oh my, oh my God, man. He's living the life. Living his best life. So <laughs> AW currently right now, they ride the wave of being able to draw a huge percentage of their viewership is the key demo. So pretty much what that means is if you look at the million viewers that watch it, roughly one third or 300,000 are that 18 to 36 year old range. What I, I guess my question is, do you think TK can be consistent long term writing just this one demographic? If he does it right, yes. But the overall viewpoint from looking at it from a top from like the top, no. Because you do sort of have to get everybody, but the way you get everybody is by telling stories and being consistent. Not like, you know, for two dynamites, you're going to get this awesome story. And then like the third dynamite in the month, you get something completely random. And then the, the story that took place two dynamites ago are going to be up on that third rampage in the month. And you're like, why do I have to do that? If it's, if it's a, if it's a main story you're pushing on the main show, keep it on the main show. Right. So like that, that's how I look at it. Uh, on one hand is yes. On the other hand is no, because like, if you don't have that consistency, it's not going to work out to where you want to like improve in the line of um, your demographic. And that demographic has changed a lot over the years. Like when Nielsen, you know, came out, that was a different, you know, that was a different generation where brand loyalty was important. Like, you know, if you drank Pepsi, during those, you know, generations of that, you know, origins, you never went to Coke. Like you were mm -hmm. brand loyal. You drank Miller Lite, you never drank Bud Light. Nowadays in that that same demographic, they do change and their their opinions change. And they don't mind like if they go to a bar, they'll try 15 different types of beers, hopefully not in the same sitting. Um, they'll try that, you know, if they only got, you know, Coke, then they're gonna get a Jack and Coke. If they only have Pepsi, they're gonna get Jack and Pepsi. Like they're they're not loyal when it comes to brands. And they're going to go to the best product. So mm -hmm. AEW might be the best product today, but if WWE does something tomorrow that they like or bring in one of their favorite AEW guys like Cody, for example, then they all just jump. So do yeah, you... Yeah, I mean... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Al. Go ahead. No, nope, you go ahead. No, no, no. What were you going to say? I don't know. Now. Did I ruin your train of thought? That's awesome. Aww. All right, look. Well, this is my question for you guys, okay? So if you look back at the late 90s when WWE was losing to Mr. Bischoff and company for 83 consecutive weeks, it's like a clever name for a podcast or something. But <laughs> what the, the thing is to keep in mind there is that let's look at it like an electoral college versus popular vote situation. Not necessarily the same way, but kind of follow what I'm saying here, Okay. In the late 90s, leading up to the birth of the Attitude Era and WWE, then WWF, retaking the lead, okay, WCW was getting more viewers overall, okay? So they were kind of, you know, winning the electoral college because they were getting the, the overall vote of it. But at the time, WWE was getting the key demo, they were averaging similar numbers to TK now between that 33 to 35 to 37%. And Vince McMahon rode that key demo all the way through the mid 90s into the Attitude Era to stay affluent in the wrestling industry, eventually being able to buy out his competition. I'm by no means asking you guys, do we think TK is going to be able to buy WWE? But if he continues to ride that, do we think we could see something like that in the future where he's able to come out ahead because he rode that key demo? No, I think unless he's a publicly traded company, he's never going to be able to purchase WWE. Well, like, unless, unless, you're, unless you're Elon Musk. I just said that he's not going to buy WWE, Bobby. What I'm asking you is, do you think he can <laughs> ride that key demo the same way WWE did in the Attitude Era in order to keep it going? 
No, because I think that's when the generational uh, key demo changed. I think right around that 2000, uh, 2005, 10, uh, 10 mark is when that demographic totally shifted over from brand loyalty to, you know, what's what's shiny today. Yeah, um, I would also have to add to that, like even back in the day when WCW first came on the scene, it was like the shiny new toy. Everyone was like, oh my God, this is so edgy. It's so different, you know, because uh, at the same time as WCW was growing, WWE was doing, well, WWF at the time was doing the same old things with the gimmicks, constant stories, you know, something that you could attach to. So that's why WWE, WWF at the time uh, kept that same demo uh, throughout the whole entire thing and then like took advantage of the shift once it happened because um, I think somebody had to tell Vince like yo you got to stop being stubborn you know a competition is here they're getting like the best ratings they're getting the best like you know reviews and pops and stuff and this is way before like we had like Twitter really knee deep in like the wrestling scene and like ruining stuff. So the fan was still like going to school the next day or going to work and going to their coworker or classmate being like, Hey, did you see it? And like, if you missed an episode, you know, that was it for you. Like it, you weren't sure if it like was going to replay or if you had DVR, luckily you'll be able to watch it. So, you know, different time frames, different mentalities, different way of looking at wrestling, different ways of like having a brand war between your friends, but hopefully it doesn't break friendships, uh, you know, cause it's not like Mario Kart or something like that where like friendships get to be broken and stuff. Um, but like just totally different things. Now, if TK continues to like ride this out and continue with the same, getting the same demo, it may like get them to the end of the tunnel where there's light something may happen where like you know he takes advantage of that generational shift but i don't know if that's going to be the case because um the internet is so vast and rampant with a lot of like hate and stuff and then like the way that uh the aw wrestlers present themselves on twitter in a very bad light that also affects them too so now we have this extra um you know variant to like affect what happens with AEW and like does that affect the ratings even more because of the bad light because of the bad uh press and stuff like that so now it's completely different okay let me play devil's advocate with you guys then could we also in a you know an alternate reality or universe be looking at a tortoise and hare situation where if not for triple h coming in and starting to revamp everything could we have seen WWE grow stagnant and AEW be able to eventually catch up with them then? Do you think, because keep in mind right now with Triple H coming in and everything is fresh and new as it is, everything right now is popping off. But had, assuming WWE continued to stay stagnant, Vince never left, do you think a tortoise and hare situation where, you know, the hare starts to get lazy in the lead and starts taking it easy... And starts getting a little bit boring with their storytelling. And, you know, next thing you know, SmackDown's dropping down to barely a million viewers a week. Like, do you think that was, do you think that was happening? No, it's WWE's been stagnant for like a decade. And there's another company out there called Impact. And they've never been able to, to over, to overcome this. You leave Impact alone. They didn't do anything to you. They're great. (laughs) WWE is a juggernaut, and even if they're a bad juggernaut, they're still going to be on the top. You know, um, it, it's like it's like I'd say like the NFL and the XFL. Is the XFL ever going to take over the NFL? No, like it's just it's just too big. It's got too much history. It's never going to happen. Um, could he get close? Yeah. Could he do what WCW did for only eighty three weeks of its fifty year uh, company uh, goal or company lifetime? Maybe, but I don't I don't think it would be a long a long term when you say 50 um, years how do you how are you getting 50 years for wcw please explain that to me i 50 years for wwe and wwe's 50 year history they only lost to another company for 83 weeks oh okay no i'm sorry i misunderstood you i thought you were saying <laughs> wcw was 50 years old i was like it uh, sounded like that for a quick second didn't it okay oh. i was making sure i clarified <laughs> i was trying to make notes in my crayon smeared <laughs> um go ahead Allison. In order for AEW to even come close, like they need to clean up backstage and TK needs to let go of the reins a little bit and bring in some people that actually know what they're doing to book these shows and to be on creative. I mean, it it seems to starting to be doing that, but like 
you know, like you were, like Marie was saying, like the the stories are not consistent. Or was Bobby saying it? One of you yeah. said it. Either way, stories like, weren't consistent. <laughs> right. Like we have this whole thing with like MJX and MJF and Mox right now. But yeah. then they have <laughs> to create a whole new a whole new wrestler. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, MJ Heaven Mox. You know, like that whole situation. Like we know that we're going to um have their thing at what is it? All in full gear. Uh, full gear. Full gear. Thank you. Yeah. But like then they also have like this contenders bullshit matches yeah. going yeah. like why are you doing this when we know that this whole other thing is happening over here like it doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. to be running two different storylines with mods like it, it's Tony Khan experienced and i think he does have the experience back there you know he's got anderson he's now got Jarrett. he had blanchard i don't know if he's mm-hmm. still there or not you know even jericho to a smaller smaller degree you know, he's got some experience back there. He needs to, like, he's got Jim Ross. Jim Ross ran WWE for a decade. Like, why not put him in a different role? Like, put him in a role that he can be part of creative and, you know, do this and teach Khan, hey, you know what? You can be buddies with this guy and go out drinking with Stone Cold. But when he doesn't show up to work, you got to call him the next day and fire him. Yeah, something like that. Like, yeah, it has to be like boss like level type of thing because you don't want your ship to sink because this is like, you know, your passion project. You don't want it to sink or whatever. Um, but I do want to go back to um Will's like initial um, you know, uh devil's advocate question. Um, as much as I agree with Bobby, I was gonna say that like, you know, if this was like seven months ago, before all like the really bad press for like the backstage stuff, I would have been like, yeah, you know, maybe there could have been a situation where it was a uh, a tortoise and hare situation where TK would eventually, you know, got up like a little bit close where like, you know, some fans would tune more, tune in more to like all the AEW product and like support it just because people were tired of like Vince doing the same thing and stuff like that. Like, you know, uh, th- th- there was a part of me that I was like, oh, I think this this can happen like seven months ago. But then like once Vince was like, yeah, I'm gone, guys. You know, I got to pay this money. I'm good. Triple H, you know, keep keep the lights on. Stephanie, you're doing wonderful. Uh, Nick Khan, it was great to meet you for about like, I don't know, three months or whatever. And let them, you know, take off. That was it. That was it. Um, you know, a- I, everyone on Twitter says that, you know, AEW might be done. But like, you know, if TK doesn't stop all the backstage uh, bad press, they might end up being done. Uh, I'm going to hop in right behind you and throw in two cents from Ravage Dragon in the chat. He says, one, TK would have to have a really good story to be able to beat WWE. Two, WWE still technically has enough money to buy most of AEW's roster. And three, TK would have to have a public relations team Mm -hmm. to save the talent on Twitter and social media. Um, I have to agree. I pretty much agree on all three of those points. Um, I think TK needs to, my big thing on the first point he made was having a good story. TK is well past the point of needing to bring somebody in to handle his booking. TK, however, is a great, he's showing that he has not a great mind, but at least a semi-decent mind for booking. He's still young in the art, but I think if he brought somebody in that could book his promotion, it could be stellar. Bring in Marie Shadow's. TK, listen to us. Give Marie Shadows the job. <laughs> I, I have I have a le- I have a legit degree in creative writing and a publishing certificate. Look, if you hire her, then I'm a shoe in to get a job there. So come on, TK, hook us up. <laughs> I'm probably still not guaranteed the job. We'll find something for you, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find something bag. for you. <laughs> Uh, do you think WWE, even if they do have the money, do you think there would ever be a situation where they would just go in and just start buying out contracts just to get the talent away from uh, AEW? Miro? Yeah, that's why I think that's why guys are getting those three-year, five-year extensions with still a year left on their contracts. Like, and it's it's happening on both sides. Like, neither one of them is wanting to lose anybody because I think I they're, I think they're doing it just like the indie circuit. Like you mm-hmm. could have some, like Duke the Dumpster Drosy who wrestled for two years in WWE appear on an indie show and it's going to say WWE Superstar and then in small letters Duke the Dumpster Drosy. Like they're they're selling it as 
AEW guy jump to WWE or vice versa. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2024 when they both start throwing money at MJF because it's going to happen. Like both companies are going to try to have him. One of the things I want to ask you guys is about WWE's contract structure. How much do you think this plays into it? So the way they do theirs is they do the three to five year contract, same as everybody else. But what they do is they do roller rolling quarterly evaluations, meaning every 90 days, they decide if you're still worth the total money in your contract and then decide then to cut you, pay you for 90 days and just be done with your contract. Do you think AEW is going to eventually have to adapt a contract system like this versus just shelling out hundreds of thousand dollars a month in payroll? Yeah, because Khan has been letting guys just have their contracts expire that he doesn't want when he mm-hmm. could have spent that money in the front end. You know, um, who's a Joey Janela as an example? Yeah. Like, you know, he, he just he just basically wrote him off TV and just, you know, he, Joey Janela for the last couple months was just like the Iron Sheik or the Honky Tonk Man in WCW, he was just sitting at home making money um, and not helping the brand. Uh, yeah, uh, as much as I don't like Joey Janela, I don't care if I get heat from him. Um, but he uh, he was working GCW most of the time before um, TK was like, you guys got to stop working GCW and stuff. Um, so he was doing that. Um, but we have seen that um, TK decided to take things seriously and be like, Moxley, I need you to sign an exclusive deal. Uh, to be an AEW exclusive wrestler because I can't have you going to GCW or anywhere else. I need to lock you down. You'll have permission to go and like, you know, wrestle in New Japan and stuff, but I need you to lock down. And I think he's starting to realize that he got to keep some of these good guys because, you know, as much as people are like, oh, you know, WWE is like evil, you know, I don't want to like go back or whatever. Like sometimes people get over the fact of like, yeah, shit happens, you know, but if they uh, put that money bag right in front of your face, like, you know, you're going to go back because you need that money to survive, unfortunately. And sometimes in this world, money talks a lot more than like, you know, something that you're passionate about that you wouldn't necessarily put like a price on it, you know? Yeah. And that's why I think that somebody like CM Punk could potentially end up back in WWE because the money's going to talk and it's going to be how much does Punk really need the money? want the money yeah and is that is that passion there from a year ago when he first signed with aew does he does he still want to do one really big match like that wrestlemania main event that he's always talked about and complained that he never had it would that be enough to draw him back in sure ravage is on fire tonight guys he's pretty much co-hosting with us um he brings up another great point and it goes into what allison was talking about earlier with jeff jarrett and the addition of house shows he says tk could save money if he got rid of dark what if they didn't eliminate dark but instead they used these house shows to be where they filmed dark so it would be an opportunity to sell the tickets for smaller venues get butts in seats help tell stories the old school territory ways by getting people to watch the house shows and then still putting it on YouTube. Do you think this is a way to blend the two to help with the revenue stream? So, Because let's be honest, running a wrestling Mm. business is expensive. The moment he goes on house show tours, he's gonna start bleeding money. That is not cheap. There's a reason why New Japan didn't break over into America for a long time is because it costs a lot of money to do it. So the moment he goes on tour, he's going to need to save that money somewhere. Do you think he can double dip and do dark and dark elevation on the road in house shows? He will have to get like a really big team, like how WWE has a big team that like drives all like um, the trucks. Um, You know, you have to get at least three different rings, maybe even more. Like, I don't know, but... It sounds good on paper, but it it's not it's not the right time for TK to do that. I I still think that um, TK should at least eliminate Dark and Dark Evelation because you know even though um, when it drops, if you get like 200k like the first like viewing or whatever, or maybe the 200k views is like after the fact, but like it's not. I, I've always said that it's not beneficial just because there are a bunch of matches. And yes, there are guys there that I know from the indies and they get a spotlight and stuff, but they're like losing. 
I wouldn't like if I was a wrestler, I would not want to show a promoter that I want to get booked on their show. Like, hey, I showed up on AW Dark. They watched the match and then they're like, well, you lost. Why should I invest my time and like a ticket in you to be on my show? Like, I've always looked at it that way that like, you know, sure, you're getting the exposure, but are you like, do you really want to show a promoter that, 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 that you lost? in a very like embarrassing way. So I think that dark and dark evolution needs to go because it's not fair for fans to sit in an arena, which is a um, live dynamite taping and you have to sit through dark, dark evolution, dynamite and, and rampage. It's not fair to the fans. It's not fair to the wrestlers. And it's like, if he eliminates it, he'll have more money in his pocket. And unfortunately guys won't have enough ways to work, but like, I don't know, man, it just bothers me that like we still have it. Yeah, I think I think it could definitely hurt your stock if you're if you're an indie guy that's like already like mid mid talent. Like that's somebody that we both know. Let's talk Chase Owens. Chase Owens. <laughs> Chase, Chase Owens appeared. He appeared on WWE TV. Sixty five minutes. And yeah, in a, in I a had handy- both of you on the show for sixty five minutes before Chase Owens got brought up. Man, I wasn't gonna bring him up, but all right, Bobby. Let's, all right, let's do this. <laughs> No, let's see if you know the story. He was on WWE TV in a handicap match against Ryback when Ryback was jobbing guys out. But if you knew, Chase was the reigning NWA junior heavyweight champion at that time. Like, that was a huge risk for him to go on there and do something like that. Now, if you're looking in the past, like you look at MJF appearing in those backstage skits, nobody knew him back then. So I don't think it would hurt him to go out yeah. there and get, get punked out. But for the NWA junior heavyweight champion to go on national TV and lose to Ryback in a handicap, that that could have really that could have really soured his career in a, in long term wise. But you know, if you're a young talent that nobody knows, or you're just you know those first two or three years of you know your indie run, then yeah, get that exposure, get to know some people, get that backstage going. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it's definitely a risk factor. Mm-hmm. See, nothing negative, nothing positive. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clip that into a TikTok and tag him in it. You should. So let's go into this and look at it from another perspective now, from the streaming side of things, okay? WWE has the deal with Peacock. Therefore, they don't necessarily focus as much on pay-per-view sales. However, AEW still does the four pay-per-views a year where they're still highly reliant on the sales of those pay-per-views. They've had a few gates over a million dollars, but their pay-per-view sales are always above average. How late to the game is AEW with getting a streaming service? I think company history, they're, they're, they're young in the game. So you don't need to come right out of the box with you know a streaming service. Like... I doubt that The Rock is going to come out with a streaming service for the XFL the first year. So, you know, I I think YouTube is a good way, a good forefront to get into the streaming service. WWE did the exact same thing um, and feel it out. You got to build a library before you can get a streaming service because you need to have enough content. Ring of Um, Honor. Sorry, I coughed and said said Ring of Honor. Sorry. (laughs) Um, Ring of Honor never had the following AEW. You know, and they've been around a long time. Like, Ring of Honor to me, when WWE was talking about bringing in um, independent shows onto their network, that to me was brilliant. Like if you're an indie and you can get on WWE Network, mm-hmm. then by means like take some of that WWE money and all that exposure you're going to get and get on the network. Like I don't I don't care if you're admitting that you're a small fish, you are into this big ocean that's WWE. But look at the audience that could draw to you and like those indie guys that you know you guys have famously decided not to work for anymore because they told you not to. Um, that's, that's stupid to me. Like they, they could have used our platform to get some more notoriety and to get some people in the seats if their show was good enough. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a very difficult question only because it's like, you know, AEW, uh, you know, got created and then you got to think about like, do we automatically launch like maybe day two a streaming service just because uh you want to be like in the game with everybody else um you know it's a very difficult question 
Uh, and I think that's why they quickly was doing like the dark, dark, uh, dark at first and then uh, dynamite to have the content and then eventually create like a streaming service. Um, <laughs> I don't know why for the time being, they don't use the Ring of Honor streaming service just to like um, have everybody go there, get a membership, get to watch the on the pay-per-views and maybe like their subscriptions will grow because it is kind of ridiculous to pay like $50 for like a um a, a pay-per-view when i can you know go on to peacock and like pay what like 9.99 still like you know whatever it is um regardless of like you know who's been doing the streaming service longer just the idea of that you know i could do this one lower price for that one you know um i mean they could utilize like um fight tv which they do i was um, about to then, ask you because i was going to bring what? up the gcw deal about the, oh, yeah. the streaming service on five uh what is it like what is it five dollars a month or like 5.99 a month yeah my question was going to be do you think five dollars a month is too much for gcw because i, I kind of feel like five dollars a month is a lot i wouldn't i wouldn't pay 99 cents i'm gonna be honest i think i'm probably gonna end up getting it and you know why you know why, why I you... want to get it? Because Allison likes cheesy deathmatch shit. That's why I'm probably going to end up with the GCW streaming service. Um, I mean, like, I, I've always said that GCW is not for me. But for the sake of this conversation, um, uh, $4.99 or $5.99, whichever one it is, um, it's not as bad as, like, you know, others. Um, like, you know, if Peacock is $9.99 or, like, the Ring of Honor one is, like, $9.99, I believe. Um, you know, or even just buying a $50 pay-per-view. So it's not as bad. Um, and it's definitely not as bad as having the uh, New Japan subscription, which is like six bucks American. So I it's have not gotten, bad. I've gotten a lot of really good use out of my New Japan subscription. I like New Japan yes. World. And by that, yeah. I mean, I watched the G1 Climax and that's pretty much it. Yeah, and then I canceled it. Uh, <laughs> but it's not just five dollars. So it's five dollars on top of the on top of the regular nine ninety nine fight subscription. And you have to use oh, the really? stupid Chromecast thing. Oh, okay. Then never mind. Because then can, you're paying. Oh my god. So you have to yeah, pay for that's... fight. So it's so how fight works is so you pay like nine ninety nine. You can pay nine ninety nine a month for. You have to pay nine ninety nine a month for fight. Okay. But then on top of that, you have to pay for your subscriptions. Or maybe it's, no, it's $4.99. I'm sorry. It's okay. $4.99. And then you, I've got a bunch of subscriptions. Okay. On so top basically, of so basically it's $9.99 to get the, the fight. And then if you want GCW, that's an added subscription. So that gets added on top of the $9.99. Yeah. Right? So I also pay. I paid 50 bucks for the year to have an impact subscription. And that gives us everything uh, impact and all their paper. Yeah. On fight. Um, so, to, so to me, so like I can you, go back and rewatch all the impact stuff. Yes. I thought we only I had would, that for the NWA. No. Or no, it's an NWA thing. Not. Um, oh yeah. Well, I, I knew we had the NWA. Kidding, stuff. Not impact. I was NWA. like, Whoa, wait a second. When did we get impact? <laughs> No, no, NWA. Um, go on. I'd say when you're doing a streaming service, you know, if you look at Peacock for nine ninety nine, you it's not just wrestling. Like you're getting yeah, you movies, you're getting you know blockbuster movies, TV shows like that. Really, pro wrestling is probably two ninety nine, a dollar ninety nine of that entire package of what you're buying. So I think comparing apples to apples. I think five ninety nine for any other company is too much money because you know WWE is not producing half of the Peacock services. Like the NFL is on there, you know. Mm -hmm. There's there's live sports on there. So Peacock for, again for nine ninety nine is a steal. And oh. I looked at my bill in a while. I don't know if I'm paying ninety nine or twelve ninety nine, but you know, it, anything under I think twenty nine or ninety nineteen ninety nine is a steal on Peacock with all the other uh, content. Yeah. That they it's just kind of like tricky of like pricing and stuff like that. Like, you know, even for like my own content, I always run into this conversation in my head about like, you know, is this too much? You know, even if I'm like offering them like a lot of things to enjoy, like, is this too much? Is this too little? Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you just got to go with your gut. Um, maybe now they could do a streaming service, AEW, you know, uh, they could always go the other route because no one really puts their stuff like on on Twitch or like, well, I mean, well, yeah, puts their stuff on Twitch to ask for like, you know, subscriptions and shit. 
like just make a subscriber base um impact did their thing where they um transformed their youtube page into like a membership so you had to get the membership in order to watch the shows and you could watch the pay-per-views on there so like they're getting in money that way like the sky's the limit with streaming services it's just a matter of like um you got to go where the crowd is at you got to go where the where the viewers are at and you know um you guys out there watching you could take this if you're a content creator you got to go where the views are at you got to go where people are at you know um because if you just randomly make a um, you know a membership over a place that doesn't have enough traffic then you're then you're like you know you're losing out money like no one's really going to go uh so for another example that popped into my head. You guys remember AEW Heels, that fifty dollar a month membership for all like the women and shit. They could they they could utilize that where like you know they could still show the pay per views and stuff and like maybe charge a little bit more if they want the extra you know benefits or something like that. And it's not just a uh, women's hangout where apparently they don't really talk about the show because somebody had to like put it on Twitter and be like, yeah, we really don't talk about the show. We just have a good time with each other. And I'm like, ah, see, that's why I didn't join. Um, not to really throw shade at anybody, but like, you know, they really said that they don't, they don't talk about the show. Like you, you're supposed to support the show, you know, but yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop building myself a, a grave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Going through kind of everything, recapping it, coming back around to actually discussing ratings now. Bobby, you brought them up once before. Let's start looking at some of these smaller guys like Impact. Impact has been around since the early 2000s. They've been able to stay consistent writing TV deals. They've been on Axis. They were on Vice. They've kind of floated around. Do we see something like that being a, a means for somebody like an MLW or an NWA now? Because both of those guys have great followings on their YouTube, but they're getting ready to gear up for TV deals. Do we think that we could see the same stuff that Impact has used to be successful for another promotion to step in like an MLW or an NWA? Yeah, I think all you need is a rabbit's foot and you need to rub it for luck because that's, I think, how Impact has stayed around for so long. <laughs> uh, you know, when you talk about like streaming services, you know, what, what would stop, you know, Billy Corgan to talk to impact to, you know, even talk to Tony Khan and just make a pro wrestling streaming service where mm -hmm. kind of like what fight does and charge a charge, charge a small amount for the subscription fee that you can split between the companies. And then every time you run a pay-per-view or a show or something, then charge an extra premium for it. Like, you know, like yeah. what's really stopping that business decision for that. Like when the NWA and WWF started taking over the world, then you had the AWA and USWF and all those other guys, you know, not successfully, but they realized they need to band together to try to take on the two juggernauts. Um, you know, obviously back then they weren't as business savvy as what they are now with Corgan and stuff like that. So, you know, why, why not just put all your eggs in one basket and go for it? Um, yeah. And I, I remember, uh, I remember this now that uh, IWTV is around where it has a lot of the indie uh, promotions and stuff like that. And they charge $10 a month and they charge $100 for the year. And they have uh, people's, you know, promotions up there that people can go and uh, watch, you know, wrestling and stuff. And then Ravage over here said MLW on HBO. MLW is currently on Pro Wrestling TV, which is a free streaming service that you can sign up. You don't have to uh, um, put any like money down for like a monthly or a yearly subscription. However, uh, the content that they have on pro wrestling television is that um, if you want to look, if you want to watch like a Warriors wrestling show, you have to like buy the show. Um, if you want to watch like um, women's, uh, what is it? Uh, women's Army wrestling, the one that Maria Canellis has, uh, her stuff is free. Um, they have like TV shows running as like an actual network cable thing. So like there are options out there. Um, you know, it's just a matter of like what AEW and TK like wants to do. Ravage says NWA on regular TV as well. Did you say that? Well, I mean, I didn't. I didn't really comment on that one. I just oh, yeah, yeah. told people where to. I told people where to go up uh, support <laughs> MOW. No, I think NWA on regular TV. I think that would make a lot of sense. Uh, Allison and I have been to a couple of live tapings for them, and we've seen the studio show. And I think it's made for like a one hour, two hour TV show. Like it would be perfect for it. It's got very old school JCP vibes. Yep. Like it would be perfect for it. Um, all right, guys, we did it. 
It's my favorite part of the episode now. We just get to plug our stuff and go home. <laughs> Miss Shadows, really? you're up. You can lead us off. All right. So uh, this was fun and amazing. I'm glad to be back on the damn show because uh, I missed you guys. It was far too long. Um, yeah, definitely. I missed you guys. Uh, well, I am Marie Shadows. You can find me on Twitter at Marie underscore Shadows. You can also sign up to my newsletter, which is MarieShadows.substack.com. There's more wrestling content there. And you can also, um, you know, when I get the chat going, you guys can uh, come into my chat room and then we can have more fun over there. And then also visit me on twitch.tv forward slash Marie underscore Shadows, where I will be having an upcoming interview with uh, Michael Richards. He's part of the Fale Dojo. And we're going to be talking about New Japan Tamashi coming up because uh, it's next weekend. So that's going to be fun. And uh, yeah, that's everything for me. Bobby Mac. Yep, you can always follow me at Yellow Shoe Guy on TikTok, Twitter, Twitch, any one that you want to choose. You can get on the Oculus and play with me in the metaverse as well. My name on that is Yellow Shoe Guy. And yes, I do realize you cannot see shoes on the Oculus. So please don't be the 1500th person to ask me that one night. I don't even see yellow shoes. Ha ha. So yeah, TikTok, we're going just over 5,200 followers. Our goal is at least hitting that $10,000 or sorry, 10,000 followers, so that way we can make a dollar on the top. So please follow me on that wrestling content and just me being stupid. Miss Siegel? You can follow me on Twitters and the Tiki Takis at justagirl918. Um, I'm finally starting to get some Tech Talk followers instead of haters. Um, I'm up to, what is it, 161? Um, need to be at a thousand so I can go live on TikTok with these two losers. Um, but yeah, give me a follow. Um, new uh, heel support group comic this week. Uh, should hopefully have that done and posted by Sunday, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so, follow the Kai Tai Show. He's the host of UWO and Rewind. Follow Mr. 8984. He is also the co-host of The Rewind. Follow Ted the Hillbilly Hill at the Hill Truth Podcast. And I'm going to take a second real quick to talk about myself because I did something really fucking big yesterday. June 2021, I was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia, APL, and yesterday afternoon, they took my fucking port out. I am 100% medically cleared from everything cancer-related, thank God. So that's done. So follow the Indie Wrestling Gazette at the Indie Gazette. Follow all the other botch bots and chair shot stuff. Follow Wrestling With The Truth. Follow M-A-T-T-R-I-D-D-E-R. Follow Marie Shadows. Follow Katie Kinsey, baby. Follow all of my friends. But now as we close another episode of Botch Pots and Share Shots, I want to take a minute. Thank you for listening. Remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave me a five-star comment leaving me telling me how terrible I am or how terrible we sound. Either way, it helps the algorithm. If you're feeling really generous and VIP, head over to patreon.com and donate to the Smack Raw Podcast Network. You get some fantastic swag. We get some fantastic guests. It's a win-win. For Marie Shadows, for Bobby Mack, and for the boss bitch, Miss Allison Siegel, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people. And I wasn't trying to do that one in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs>